So without wishing to sort of maybe spark any kind of controversy with this, not the idea at all, but just really for the conversation, I have heard an opinion expressed by more than one physicist that the false equivalency is being drawn between non-dual spirituality and what we're learning about quantum physics, that they, they're both a bit strange and we're using one strange thing to explain another strange thing. So how can, can you reassure us that these people are wrong? They're in the old paradigm. <laughs> Menace, do you want to take a bite, bite at that one? Um, uh, yes, Nick. Um, I know, it's the, just because something is unknown and something else is unknown, and then you can't say, well, one unknown explains the other unknown, and then we get un unknown out of the unknown. You know what I mean by that. Um, however, <laughs> beyond, beyond the superficiality of, okay, we have something that, looks this way and something else that looks this way and they're very similar, maybe they're the same. There is a fundamental noetic element to quantum theory from the very early stages of quantum mechanics. Uh, the measurement problem, which is, uh, is still with us. Um, um, I, I believe that uh, this problem has not been solved. They're trying to get around it, but perhaps by not the collapse of the wave function. And the multiverse, I, I, I the multiverse is an interesting idea, but I think it's maybe way too much for my taste. Uh, but in any case, uh, you know, the measurement problem was there from the very beginning. It still is. So there's a quantum, what I, I said in my book, um, uh, The Conscious Universe, is that the quantum mechanics um, open the door to consciousness through the issue of the observer and the observer. Classical physics, Newtonian physics, and again I have to emphasize that not necessarily Newton himself, because Newton himself was the first quantum physicist. He was the first one who actually thought that light is made of particles and not of waves. And so he was the first quantum physicist, but in any case, a little historical paragraph there, um, parenthesis. Uh, the point is that quantum theory opened the door to noetic, to the noetic, the vast noetic field that uh, John was talking about earlier uh, this afternoon. Uh, and once the door has been opened, it cannot be closed. Now, we still have a long way to go, okay? Uh, my uh, humble opinion is that we cannot explain consciousness as an object, even though there are objective aspects of consciousness, because at ultimate level, pure consciousness is the ultimate subjective field of all knowingness. The door opened, and it cannot be closed. Yes, the two look totally different. One starts from the material point of view, the matter, and the other starts from the noetic, or from the mind. However, today we know that the quarks, the strings, superstrings, um, the Higgs boson, all these are, as John said, vibrations in an infinitely extended quantum field. Particles don't exist. What exists today are happenings, or haps, as some physicists call it. They're, they're events. And therefore, as soon as you get away from the idea of a hard particle with a finite existence in space and time, then the noetic field opens up. Now, it may sound to a skeptic, and all scientists are skeptics to a certain extent. It may sound to a skeptic like we're pushing too much in one direction, but by pure reason, if you follow pure reason, ultimately my belief is that you come up to the realization, the understanding that the entire universe must be conscious, because there's no other way around it. Thank you, John. And John, would you... Agree with that generally. That was very well put. I, I, I might. I've got a secret about physicists. <clears throat> they don't tend to know anything about consciousness. Mm. <laughs> Maybe a dozen or two, honestly. Yeah. yeah. But um, they've never studied. They've been schooled in a tradition where consciousness doesn't even exist. Uh, typically speaking, they've never given it a second thought. You know, we, we were we were the people who wore the pocket protectors, <laughs> looked at goggles. We were technically called nerds. And we were pushed into the world of physics and quantitative science because we had no people skills whatsoever. <laughs> um, 
And so we took those courses, and we were schooled in this idea of how to you know, master the material world and engineering and computer science. And we just had never given consciousness a second thought. If it weren't for me, someday I was 17 under the recommendation of a doctor, being in a body cast at the time, that you know, I should try meditation because it may actually help me get over my nonstop fever and help me sleep. I started, and that slowly but surely opened up a whole new world, and I started to see the connection. I started to know something about consciousness. That's the thing. I knew something about consciousness from direct experience. So if a scientist comes up and says, well, you know, I don't believe this or that about consciousness, your first response should be, well, who cares? Um, you know, you could ask a plumber or a dentist or whatever about consciousness or a physicist, and you're going to get the same uninformed answer, typically. Um, so they're just completely different worlds of study. And what's happening is that more and more people, I think, it's a sign of rising consciousness, who are you know, deeply schooled in physics and because of quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, unified field theory, these are you know, deep thinkers, not most of them. Most people, including most physicists, do what they can in their life to avoid thinking. But there are some natural deep thinkers, and quantum mechanics is presenting certain puzzles and challenges, and if you're intellectually curious and you pursue them, you'll come up with what Menas said. And it's not just, well, these things are sort of the same, so maybe they are one, that consciousness in the unified field, for example. Uh, a year or so, I gave a punishingly too detailed mathematical exposition of why quantitatively and exactly they are the same, mathematically, structurally, functionally, behaviorally. So you can push that and really start to see that it's not just a poetic connection anymore, which it might have been 30 years ago with the beautiful books of, say, Fritzsaf Capra and, and others who are starting to see the connection quantum mechanics was pointing to. Things have gone a long way since then. But again, most physicists will neither know about the superstring nor about consciousness, and therefore, or even quantum mechanics, I should say, because you can make deep connections on that level too, and therefore really aren't so competent to comment on the relationship between the two. Hmm. Lothar, do you have a, yes, a word on that? Am I still on? I hope so. Yep. You still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, n needless to say, things we say are controversial, but for example... <laughs> um, when, when I'm saying there's a non-empirical part to reality, it is not philosophy, it's a fact. Okay. Um, very simple example. Molecules, atoms, they exist in quantum states. A molecule has practically infinitely many of these states. It occupies one of them, all the others are empty. Empty states, they are mathematical forms. You can't see them because they're empty, there's nothing there to see. But they are there. If they weren't there, molecules couldn't do anything. If, if the molecules in our body didn't have empty states, we'd just fall down where we wouldn't even exist. Uh, so these are things that are real, but you can't see them. That's just one simple example. Or, you know, electrons in atoms. We can only understand atoms or molecules using Schrodinger's physics. Schrodinger's mechanics says the electrons in atoms, they are not particles, they are waves. There's no other way to explain their properties. What kind of waves? Probability waves. What are probabilities? They are numbers. The, atoms, the electrons in atoms are forms. But to add, and yet, the interaction of these forms determine the visible order of the world. Two atoms meet, their waves interact, they make a molecule or not. The molecules in your body, their waves interact and keep you alive. So, these are facts. Um, it is so, it's so unexpected. Now here, you know, also the connection when you say these waves, they have mind-like properties. Physicists weren't looking for that. They were kind of, but they were kind of nudged into this direction like, 
Okay, so the electrons in atoms are probability waves. Probabilities, they're patterns of information. Information is normally directed to a mind. So someone says, there's a mind. Stupid, there's no mind. <laughs> Potentiality waves. You know, state of potentiality. Your thoughts are potentiality. They are the best way to understand what potentiality is because they are real. You don't know my thoughts. They are real for me. And so are John's. <laughs> so, Mine they have a not. nature... <laughs> pun? Mine are not. No, just <laughs> Let's talk about that. <laughs> 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 they have the nature of a potentiality because they can come out and express themselves in an energetic way like in sound or you write it down or something or maybe not mm-hmm. I have some right now I'm not going to talk to you about <laughs> just, just to show you <laughs> well let me just stay with you Lotai, if I may um, so for forever we were living in a new Newtonian world of, of cause and effect and, and uh, technology seems to be mostly Newtonian, perhaps some evolution towards quantum computing, what have you. And it turns out for the past 100 years we've been living in a quantum universe after all. But how do we know this? How does, how does knowing we live in a quantum universe as opposed to a Newtonian universe, what difference does that make? to the way we live, the way we perceive ourselves, our sense of self, in some sort of everyday practical sense. How would you, how would you nuance well, that out? Many simple answers. Um, the the classic, <coughs> excuse me, classical world was a segregative world. Things were typically separated. Physics separated from biology, the sciences separated from philosophy, um, all of this separated from the arts. And one thing that was typically separated was morality. There is this, this naturalist fallacy, David Hume, who said what is and is not the case has nothing to do with what ought and ought not to be done. People who believe that living in accordance with the order of the universe is basis of a moral life, they're stupid. Well, in a universe, in a quantum universe, that is wholeness, where everything is interconnected, that changes. The classical system has such a strength because it was so logically consistent. In a system of separate things, the moral principles of of aggression and selfishness, Darwin's morality, that's it. You have to do that. It's just part of the game. In such a world, you can also go out in the world. If you can catch a country, eh, you should do it. <laughs> if you can have a bank and ruin the rest of humanity, you should do that. But when everything is connected, all this changes. Because in a world that is a wholeness, if I cheat him, I cheat myself. I may still try it, but uh, <laughs> anything you do, and you know, basically, yeah, the, this wholeness, we have a longing to be in touch with it. We were kicked out. That's the, that's the story of the paradise. paradise. Mm-hmm. But paradise is not, you know, a land of plenty where the pe- Kentucky Fried Chicken is flying around. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> it's a wholeness. Everything good. Everything that you do, kindness and love and connection, allows you to be in touch with the wholeness, and that's why it feels so good. So, I, I would like to very much support. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, what quantum mechanics we just heard it brings to light the interconnectedness of everything and everyone, even at a distance, and. Quantum field theory, unified field theory, reinforce that same message, that at our core, we are one. And it is literally true, if you do harm to someone, you are doing harm to yourself. Because at the deepest level of our being, there is no difference. And understanding that as this emerging world of quantum mechanics and unified field theory, which will probably take about another half a generation, not that long, 
to make it way into the schools from the graduate departments at university will have an impact. I mean, every civilization is a reflection of the knowledge on which it is based. And we're still living in a very much classical world. If you look at the map, geopolitical map, crisscrossed by boundaries that arbitrarily separate humanity from humanity, that is based on antiquated knowledge. And the unity of life coming more and more to the fore is inevitable. The discovery of the Higgs, hopefully soon the discovery of its brothers and sister Higgs, which will be a huge milestone, confirming, we hope, the presence of supersymmetry, which is the cornerstone of the unification of everything. It's happening. And that intellectual understanding alone will begin to shape through the schools at an early and early age the thinking and behavior of people. Ultimately, intellectual understanding can only go so far when the steamroller rolls over your toe, the philosophy goes out the window. It's important, ultimately, to ground one's physiology and brain physiology in the reality of unity in higher states of consciousness and not just live on the intellectual or even feeling level, but to live life on the level of one's being, unity on the level of being. And that's happening, too. And that's making its way into the schools even faster than the intellectual understanding of the unity of life is making its way into schools. So I'm a, an optimist. I think things are moving really fast in a slightly unpredictable direction, but the overall direction is really good, I think. We are, we're all here. <laughs> we're all here. This is testimony that this is happening. Right? It's happening now. It's not happening tomorrow. The fact that all of us, all of you, all of us are here is a testimony that a shift in consciousness is taking place. And indeed, perhaps we have to rely on the future generations, on the next generations. Because the old timers were, you know, maybe our, I'm not much of a neuroscientist, but maybe our our grooves in the brain are now, you know, they're just going the same way, the same old patterns, same old patterns, same old patterns. So I do hope, in fact, that the new generation will make this shift. They have to, by the way, they have to. They have to. I mean, you know, well, how many years do I have ahead of me? Maybe 20, 30 years? Well, you know, if I'm hopeful and all of that. They have uh, 50, 60, 70, 100 years ahead of them. And they got to make the shift, or else. I mean, it is actually a primal need of transformation. And I'm quite serious about this. If this transformation does not take place, we have a binary choice. Either we transform ourselves and society, or we reach pretty close to extinction. Not necessarily the Earth. The, here I differ a little bit from my green friends, you know, the, the friends, you know, the, the ecologists and the uh, people who are really fighting for um, a change of environmental, the environment and protecting the earth. Of course, the earth needs to be protected, but the earth will find itself. The earth is an alive, alive entity. It's a Gaia, it's a Gaia, right? As we say in Greek. The earth will find the next species to take over. In fact, they have already taken over. You know who they are. They're the insects, right? They are already taken over. <laughs> so the question is, we humans, are we going to be in harmony with the environment, in harmony with ourselves, or are we going to drive ourselves close to extinction, at least in the sense of a modern society? And you, you know that this is happening. It happened in Europe. I don't want to go in a negative path and start talking about the problems of Europe and the problems of the United States, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the, 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 the common people, the, the young people are beginning to feel it. They, they, need for transformation is there. Now, we do have, we do have, we do have, let me emphasize a third time, the intellectual superstructure, quantum physics, and superstring theory, and the vibrating fields have opened the door to consciousness. Now, those scientists who are blind and don't want to hear it, that's fine. They're going to die off anyway. <laughs> Sooner or later, they're going to be under six feet of Earth. It's the new generation I'm looking towards because it's the new generation that may need to become quantum physics and understand and need to go beyond quantum physics, beyond quantum physics because we have to integrate biology 
the big other science. We have to integrate biology with quantum theory. And we cannot do it as a physicist. We have to bring the biologists to help us to do that. Thank you.